Good evening. It's good to see every one of you here on this wonderful Wednesday evening. Hope you're glad to be here as much as we are. Uh, we welcome any guests that we may have with us tonight. If you've visited with us for the first time or second or whatever, and you've never filled out a guest information card, please do that. It's in the seat back in front of you and put that in the offering bucket when it comes by in just a bit. Church family, let's welcome anybody that might be visiting with us tonight. It's always so important to honor our guests. Uh, also, a couple other announcements. Um, as I stated last Wednesday, we have a seminar coming up that's going to be taught by Sister Donna Valentine, and there is a sign-up table in the back back there. It's, the name of it is Your Life, Your Legacy, and it's you know end-of-life stuff that we need to talk about now and not later and leave it in the hands of our you know family to deal with. So uh, lunch is going to be provided that day. That's going to be on June the 26th, which is a Monday at 1130. Uh, the important thing is, is make sure you sign up and do so back there because they're going to feed us lunch that day and, and they're going to need a head count for, for that event that day. And uh, so you'll want to be here for that. There's also a pamphlet back there you can pick up and take it home and, and read up on it and get prepared for that. And then also coming up this Sunday is Pastor Jeff and Pastor Braden's last Sunday and, um, you know, we say that with saddened hearts, but we're also glad that they're staying in the Lord's will. Amen. Amen. And uh, we're going to have a reception for them Sunday evening uh, after the PM service. So come prepared for that. And uh, we're going to send them off in the name of the Lord. Amen. Can we just stand tonight? And let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you tonight, God, for your goodness and who you are, Lord. And Lord, we just ask your blessing, God, over this service tonight, over the Bible study, God, over the worship, and Lord, over our children and youth, God. Pour out your spirit, Lord God, and we'll forever give you praise in Jesus' name. Let the church family say amen. Amen. Well, I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Half has never yet been told. Well, I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of Well, I have found that hope so bright and clear, living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near, I can see His smiling face. For it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. waves of glory roll, for it is like a great or flowing well springing up within my soul, for it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory, or the half has never yet been Go ahead and praise him and turn around, say howdy or hey or bonjour, bonsoir, whatever it is you say around here before you're seated. been 
untold. Amen. You may be seated. We want our ushers to come tonight. Let me say we have uh, seven kids and kids and or seven kids, four teenagers in need of help to get to camp. And if you can sponsor uh, one of those children, it's $165. If you could sponsor and help one of those kids, it would be a great blessing uh, to just help out with that. And if you have questions about it or anything of that nature, just please let us know. But if you're somebody likes to sponsor a kid for camp, they need some sponsors. And we would greatly appreciate it this evening. Father, we just thank you that we're able to bring to you our tithe and our offerings. And we ask God... In the name of Jesus, that you would just bless your people. Father, I just ask God that you would just uh, minister, meet the needs as only you can do. And we give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirst. Aren't you thankful that he'll fill our cup? Amen. Amen. He is so good. And you know, Jesus answers prayers. And to prove it tonight, Sister Jan is going to come and share a testimony. She said that she would be brief. And I told her, you take your time. I'll take, but I will take the microphone away from you at 730 (laughs) for sure. But uh, she, she just wants to come and give a testimony. I don't want to miss anything that the Lord has done for me in the past few days. The first thing on this note says coffee. I guess I have to go to Brookshire's. What am I? Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Now, after I get my coffee, uh, I'll go on to this. Last week, well, let me back up. I promise I really am going to be brief. Uh, For years now, I've had back pain. Uh, I have scoliosis, and anybody knows anything about that, it just gets worse as you get older. And I've not taken care of my back. I've done things probably I shouldn't have been doing. But uh, the past year, it seemed to have just tripled, quadrupled, and gotten so bad so quickly. Uh, Man, I'm still not doing it? Okay. And uh, so I finally broke down and went to the Spine Institute, And I went uh, last week and got the results. When he walked in, he was shaking his head. He said, your back is bad, really, really bad. Well, I knew it was bad, but he didn't have to come in there talking like that, you know. So, uh, and he showed me the picture. And, (laughs) you know, you don't have to be a doctor to see that it was bad and is bad. And uh, he told me that the surgery to correct it would be major and would take three months to recover. And uh, he said, of course, you know, we can control the pain with shots. That scared me worse than any of it. I don't want any shots in my back. But uh, anyhow, we sat there and we talked. And then I looked at him and I said, you can call me a fool if you want to. You can call me crazy. But I believe in miracles. And I believe God can heal my back. He said, oh, I believe in miracles. Let me tell you a couple. (laughs) And he sat there and told me two miracles. 
And when I left there, we were both crying and hugging and praising God for the miracle of healing my back. Now, I'm still shook up, okay? I'm sitting in the parking lot trying to gather my composure, and I'm looking at that MRI picture, and um, when, I, when I could finally drive, I came to the cross, and I took that MRI picture, and I sat on that bench. And I don't really remember a lot of praying because I was in no shape to pray. I, I, I couldn't say words. All I could do was cry and moan and say, Jesus, you can heal me. Jesus, you can do this. I'm giving it to you. I, because, and, I, and, and one thing I was praying about is this fear because fear was overwhelming me. I, I was, you know, Satan was trying to put in my mind a picture of myself as a cripple. And I, so anyway, I get in my car. My radio is on all the time. So when I crank my car, my radio immediately begins playing. Now, this is what played. Katie Nicole, she sings that song that we're all familiar with, um, In the Name of Jesus. We, we sing it here. This is the first words I heard when I turned on my car. I pray for your healing. Boy, she was belting it, belting it out. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee <laughs> in Jesus' name. Well, you can imagine what kind of Holy Ghost time I was having in that car. <laughs> and, um, and then, I think it was the next morning, I'm sitting outside early in the morning. It must have been about 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't usually get up until 5 o'clock. And I got up, and I was sitting outside drinking coffee. And I have a little playlist in my phone, and I put on rattle. <laughs> hey, these dry bones are going to rattle, and God is going to heal them. But while I was play playing that, you know, you, you know when the Holy Ghost comes on you? I've had the Holy Ghost come on me. I, you know, I have spoken in tongues. I've, I've had that wonderful, wonderful feeling of just been sw swept up with him. This was different, y'all. This was different. I don't know what my neighbors was thinking. If I woke up anybody, I didn't care because I was in the presence of the Lord. Twice, two different songs, he gave me confirmation that he is the healer, and he can take these old bones, and he can straighten them up and heal them. Now, what else do I not want to forget? Oh, well, you hear this one. So I'm laying in bed, and I'm laying on my back. And I'd had a pretty rough day. And all of a sudden, all across my lower back, everywhere there has been pain, it felt like somebody put a heating pad on me. The heat was intense, but it didn't burn. It didn't hurt. It felt good. And I said, Lord, where is this coming from? And I knew he was touching my back. I believe it, folks. I know it to be true. And if you don't believe that, I got one more. I got a great grandbaby that's seven and a half months old, and she weighs more than a sack of taters. You hear me? <laughs> that is a chunky little monkey. And I can't help it. I, I got to pick her up. I have to tote her around. I mean, she expects it of me, and I want to do it. But after a day of that, I mean, I am like this and can hardly walk, and the pain is so horrible. I think, and I can't do that again, but do. I kept her all day long, picking her up, putting her down, wagging her on my hip. Didn't have one pain all day long. <laughs> So, folks, don't tell me <laughs> he's not still the healer. Now, do I still have some pain? Yeah, I had a little pain coming up here today. And Satan said, you're going to go up there and give that testimony and then with, with you in pain right now? And I said, this ain't no intense pain. And, yeah, I'm going to give that testimony because he may not do the whole healing at one time. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And I got friends sitting in here that needs healing. And they're going to heal every one of them, too. There's a lady sitting right there. She never complains. She wouldn't tell you what all's wrong. She sits there, and she comes in smiling, and she leaves smiling. God's going to heal her of all of it. Sherry, 
She's got uh, the liver disease that God's going to heal her of. Sandy, you got the same problem I do. God's going to touch your back. Donna, you can't hardly stand up sometimes back there because the pain's so bad. But God's going to heal you. Teresa, you got the swelling sometimes you can't hardly stand. God's going to heal you too. There is nothing he can't do and there's nobody he can't heal. Preach, sister, preach. He's the healer, isn't he? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 8. We are still on the stories that Jesus told. And the title of this is A Sower Went Out to Sow, but Luke chapter 8. And we're going to begin in the fourth verse. And uh, I'm about to say there's some notes back there, but the notes are all gone. If you need some notes, just call up to the church and we can get you a copy of them. Uh, in my notes, I'm on page 13. If you're on page 12, flip a page. All right, Luke 8, verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. He told them a story. Jesus said, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So when Jesus says that, he's... What, you know what he's saying? There's more to this story than just a story about seed. Then it goes on, the Bible says, Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? You know, by that question, they're saying, Our ears aren't working. We need to know what this means. And he said, he said To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, this, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, fall away. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. All right, so as I said uh, earlier, we are looking at this parable and looking at the stories that Jesus told. And this, this parable that we are looking at tonight, Jesus, I, I just titled this lesson. It starts with the first words that Jesus said, A sower went out to sow. A sower went out to sow. In, in an agrarian society where farmers, everybody depended on farming, uh, such as the first century Israel, Jesus was using something that everybody was familiar with. Everyone was familiar with farming. They were familiar with, with sowing seed, with all that was entailed in that because that was the society in which they lived. So everybody listening to him, they were familiar with the imagery. When, when Jesus said a sower went out to sow, they, they immediately had a picture in their mind of a guy out in the field throwing the seed. They knew what it looked like. They knew what was going on because they, it was portraying what their life was like. And while not everyone understood the full import of what Jesus was saying, they could understand the basics of the story. And now many have called this the parable of the soils. But Jesus himself, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18, calls it the parable of the sower. Jesus calls it the parable of the sower. Now, 
in the story, the sower is Jesus. It's pretty easy to know, isn't it? Jesus is the sower. But, but as we are going to see that today, the sower represents any of God's people who share the Word of God. All of us are to be sowers of the Word of God. Because the Word of God is the indestructible seed. It is, it is that seed that is sown, the Word of God. And it's a story that's filled with sadness and that three out of the four will not grow into what God desires them to be. But it's also a story that's filled with hope because those that persevere will produce a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold, he says in another place. So let's look at these different kinds of soils that are mentioned in this story that Jesus told about the sower. The first one is the hard soil. Look again at verse 5. The hard soil. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Verse 12, Jesus explains it. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the first type of soil, it is hardened because it is soil that has been trampled underfoot. Jesus says that it fell by the wayside. And the wayside, uh, the, the soil was hardened by the wayside because that was the footpath that separated the plots and ran through the common field. So this soil landed on hard ground. And there are two things that are important to note about this soil. Number one, the seed cannot penetrate it due to its hardness. And number two, the birds of the air, which represents the devil, comes in and swoops down and takes the seed before it ever has a chance of even trying to penetrate that hard ground. Now, this is a scenario that is all too common. Every day that someone is away from Christ is one more day for their heart to grow harder. The longer people reject the Lord, the more difficult it is to get them to receive the Lord. You ever met a hard-hearted person? Huh? I mean, just hard, don't want to hear it have no desire to know anything about God or what they know about Him. I mean, the seed has, has touched them. The Word has touched them at one time, but they're hardened towards God. And it is hard, no pun intended, to get through to them. Because usually hard heads are attached, or hard hearts are attached to hard heads. They don't want to hear what God is saying. They don't want anything to do with the Word of God. And there are a lot of reasons why people may have, have allowed things in this life to come in and to harden them. But the fact of the matter is, is that some people have hard hearts. And they want nothing to do with God. The writer of Hebrews warned believers to stay on guard that their hearts not become hardened. Look at what Hebrews says. Hebrews 3.12 Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened, listen, through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, sin is deceitful. It's deceitful. It looks fun. It looks appealing. But there are a lot of things that go along with that, that in the long run, you realize I was fooled by sin. It deceived me. I allowed it to deceive me. And he says that our hearts can be hardened because of the deceitfulness of sin. He says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So there are three things here that harden the heart. Unbelief hardens the heart. The deceitfulness of sin, uh, refusing exhortation hardens the heart. And the deceitfulness of sin hardens the heart. These things come in and people's hearts are hardened against God. Their, their heart becomes calloused against Him. The person that has a hardened heart is the most difficult to reach, but I've got good news. It's not impossible. Hallelujah. Some of you were those hard-hearted people. 
that, that nobody could get through. I mean, they just, no one could get through to you, but somehow the Lord got through to you. And maybe you have somebody that you know in your life that is hard-hearted, and they are not living for God, and you feel like there's no way they'll ever live for God. And you're like, God, they don't want to serve you. They want nothing to do with you. If I even mention Jesus, they bristle, they get angry, they get mad at me. They don't want any part of it. Their heart is totally hardened. But there, there are two things that we need to do if they're hardened to see them come to Jesus. Number one, we should pray that God will give them a heart of flesh. That God would begin to get through to their heart. Listen to what the Bible says in Ezekiel 36. Verses 25 through 27. And I'm just going to read you one verse. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So we need to pray that God would get through their hardened heart. That he would, he would be able to take that stony heart out and replace it with a heart of flesh. But at the same time, number two, we must engage in spiritual warfare for their souls. Remember he said, it fell on that hard ground and the birds came. Well, remember the story in Genesis 15. Abraham, God had him prepare a sacrifice Abraham fell asleep. There was this, and as he was, was trying, or before he went to sleep, the Bible says these birds came in. Look at what it says. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, he drove them away. Now that, that sacrifice that he prepared, it represented the promise of God that God was going to give him a son. That God was going to give him an heir. And God was speaking to him that night. And he prepared this sacrifice. And here comes the birds to try to take it away. And I want to say something. Our children may be the same way. They may be hard. They may be hard to get through to them. And, and you know that seed is, has landed there. But that bird, those birds are coming to take it away. we got to fight off the birds. I, I know I've probably said this before, but when I was a kid, I hated mockingbirds because they had attacked me. I mean, just, they would attack me mercilessly. My uncle told me one time, he said, he said, Jefferson, if mockingbirds were the size of eagles, we'd all be doomed. Because they're just mean. These mockingbirds would attack me, and I'd have to go check the mail for an, an old man, Mr. Turner. And uh, Mama would say, you go check the mail. And you know how we check the mail? I walked to his house, got his key, and then I walked to the post office. Just send me out alone, Mama, in this old cool world. Got old Dexter living down the road. He's killing people. But you're sending me out there to go check the mail with mockingbirds flying to get me. And I went to Mr. Turner's, and uh, he gave me his key, and he said, Your mama told me you're scared of the mockingbirds. I said, Yes, sir. And he said, Go out there. There's a stick in the yard over there. Go grab that stick, and you just swing at them. Well, I never hit a mockingbird in my life. That's the same as putting salt on its tail. I can't do that either. I was afraid of the birds because they would attack me. And I want to say something. There are devils out there that you're afraid of, and they're trying to swoop in and steal the seed of the Word of God off of those lives that you have invested in. They may be hard-hearted, but you better get up and do some spiritual warfare and fight those critters off and make sure they don't get the seed of the Word of God that you have put there. The Word of God is, is able to get through. You ever see pictures of, of big boulders that have, a, have split in two because of one seed that grew and a root that grew down into that thing, and over time it split that thing in two? Listen, if the bird doesn't get the seed, that seed is going to germinate, and it's going to split through that rock in Jesus' name. He's going to do the work for the hard-hearted. And so if you ever want to live in the abundance of the Lord, you need to allow the Lord to break up that hard heart. Number two, then he talks about the shallow soil, the shallow soil. Luke chapter 8, verse 6 and verse 13, Jesus said, Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Verse 13, But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, 
And these have no root who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now, unfortunately, there are far too many people who fit in this category. Jesus said these are people who joyfully receive the word. They are excited about the prospect of serving the Lord. And and quickly it begins to spring up. It looks like there's life there. God is doing a work. I mean, they're excited about it. But our Christianity is more than just an outward excitement. There has to be a depth to our walk with God. The hard part is growing deep in God. It's easy to just spring up overnight and be excited about what the Lord's doing, what you feel, what you're experiencing. You've got to grow some roots in Jesus' name. When when the difficulty of temptation hits them, the Bible says they wither under the onslaught of it. Jesus gave us the key to having a heart that is not like the shallow, shallow soil here. John 8, 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So when we abide in him, that's our abiding is when we are putting down roots into God where we are growing in the grace of God. And the deeper the roots get, the more, the more you're going to grow in Him, the more secure you are in Him, the stronger you are in Him. We have to put down roots and not be a people that have no grounding. There's a lot of people that are, that are a mile wide and an inch deep. You go through the storm, southeast Texas, hurricanes come through. There's oak trees blown over everywhere. But you don't see many pine trees that are blown over. You know why? They have a deeper taproot. Them oak trees, it's just all surface level. There's, they're beautiful trees. My dad has a beautiful oak tree he planted 30 years ago in his front yard. And we'll sit out on the porch sometimes and say, man, your tree's looking pretty. He's like, I hope a storm don't blow it on the house. 30 years ago, he, per- he planted it far enough away, but it's big enough now. It, if, if it blows that direction, it, it could very well land on his house. And you know, the thing about it is, it's because he knows that tree doesn't have the root system that a pine tree would. They're just lightning rods. That's all they are. But, <laughs> but the thing about these oak trees, they, they blow over and, and the roots aren't deep. I want us to be a people that have deep roots in God, that when the storms come, they don't blow us over. That when, when, when things happen in our life, that we are rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 said this about Jesus. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. In times of drought, are you drinking deep from the wellspring of life? Where there is no moisture, we can grow up as a tender plant as a root out of dry ground because we have found the source of life. The apostle Peter warned us about having no death, depth. He said in 2 Peter 3, 17, you therefore beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. If you don't spend time with the Lord, with your Bible, in prayer, being a part of the church, part of the fellowship of the church, if you you don't do those things, it's hard to grow deep in Jesus. I'm going to say one even further. It's impossible. If you don't have a consistent devotion life with the Lord, it is impossible. You need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to move deeper into the things of the, of the Word instead of spending all of our time looking for some new revelation on how to avoid the cross. I know people will go to this preacher and that preacher for a word because they're A, too lazy to pray, 
B, too lazy to read the Bible. And three, crazy. I mean, just absolutely insane. I remember when I was a young man in college, I had my buddies. They called me up. I was new in all this stuff. They said, Jeff, you got to go to this church with us. And it was a non-denominational church. I didn't know anything about it. Never heard of it. Got to go to this church with us, Jeff. Man, they've got this guy there. He prophesies. He prophesies. He prophesies over everybody. He gives words to everybody. And uh, so I went with him to church. And you know what he did? He gave words to everybody. Thankfully, he didn't give any words to me. The only word I had was, don't come back to this place. This guy is a fruit loop. And I was old enough to know that. This guy's absolutely insane. And one of the guys who went with us that night, he had told me about a buddy, one of our buddies. He said, hey, I need to talk to so-and-so. I said, what do you need to talk to him for? He said, I just need a word from the Lord. And so when I saw my friend, I said, hey, so-and-so said he needs to see you because he, he said he needs a word for the Lord. And my friend said, I got a word for him. I said, you do? He said, I sure do. I said, what is it? He said, repent. He comes to me, I'm going to tell him he needs to repent. Going looking for a word from me. I got his word. I don't know if they ever got together or not, and I don't know if he repented or not. I wasn't an intermediary between them. The thing about it was is that that one guy, he was shallow. He was shallow. He's the one who took me to the prophet that night. He was shallow. And, and I would rather have somebody that has an enduring faith and learn from them than every shallow crackpot that pops up everywhere you turn around. Listen, there are prophets of many. You can find them anywhere. You can find them and they'll tell you everything you want to hear. But you better beware the people you're listening to. You better beware the people you're feeding on. Because they may be feeding you poison. Grow deep in the Lord Jesus Christ and you won't be deceived by false prophets. If you want to live in the abundance of the Lord, you must grow in your inward walk with the Lord and you have to put down roots in Him. Number three, the crowded soil. The crowded soil, Luke 8, verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Then Jesus explains it. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares Riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. The crowded rep soil represents people who get too busy for God. If the devil can't snatch the word from you, if he can't tempt you to the point of giving up, he'll do everything he can to make your life too busy for God. Anybody ever met some busy people? Does it seem like people are busier than they've ever been in their life? I mean, just busy. I mean, they, they, have, they have no time for anything. My mama McGraw one time told Julie, she said, you know, nobody comes to see me because they're too busy. Well, one day they won't be too busy to die. She was right. She found the day she was too busy not to die. We are a busy society. Some of it's good, but how many of you feel like a lot of the business is just a waste of time? We, we always are, are doing things where we're busy, busy, busy. And, and it seems like that as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, the more we are pressed for time. We have all these time-saving things that are out there today microwaves, cars, you name it, things to do things faster than we've ever done before. And it seems like we just keep piling ourselves up with more and more of useless things. And it's taking away our joy. It's taking away, you know, how many of you have ever sit by and thought, you know, it probably wouldn't be too bad being Amish. But then I think about how much I like air conditioner and I know I don't want to be no Amish. But we, we, we get busy in life. We get busy with things. And the three things that Jesus said will crowd the Lord out of our life, he said, number one, cares. 
then riches, then pleasures of life. And Jesus called these things thorns. Now, each of them in and of themselves, in moderation, whatever, they're not so terrible in itself. Uh, we, we all have cares, but we should not allow our cares to consume us to the point of falling away from God. Casting all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. But Jesus said the cares of life come upon us. There are some times that people have issues that they are going through that are so great. These cares are so great and they try to carry them so much and they're unable to. It crushes them down. They're just overburdened. I, I can't tell you the number of people of the years I've been in church, the years I've been in ministry, the number of people that have had cares and as a result of it, instead of bringing it to Jesus, they just fell away from the Lord. Then he goes on and he talks about riches. We need money to, su to survive, but don't allow the love of money to crowd out your love for the Lord. It's okay to have money. It's okay. Jesus doesn't condemn people if they're rich just the same way he doesn't condemn them if they're poor. It's okay to have riches. Just make sure that riches don't own you. The Bible says, 1 Timothy, listen, for the love of money, not money. I, how many of you have heard people say money is the root of all evil? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. There was one charlatan preacher several years ago who actually got on TV and said, money is the root of all evil. You need to get the evil out of your life. Send it to this address. <laughs> And some people wrote him a check. They wrote him a check because he was still on the air. He's still on the air as far as I know. Money's the root of all evil, so send me your evil. I'll get it out of your house. You better believe he will. But the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How many, how many of these people that become stars, they become rich and famous, and you look at their life and you're like, I wouldn't want to be them for everything in the world. They're strung out on drugs. They've got, they've got this problem, that problem. They're just, they're famous, but miserable. They're rich, but miserable. And, and all the things that happen in their life because they, they, they got these great riches. But if you don't have God in the midst of that, it can lead to a life of misery, a life of, of not having what you need in God. And there are people that are give up serving the Lord because they love money. We all need also times to relax and enjoy the good things of life. But some allow the desire for pleasure to be the overwhelming force of their life. Paul told Timothy that in the last days that there would be people who were lovers of pleasure. James explains why so many people become disheartened with God in regard to their search for pleasure. He says in James 4.1, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. It's the person that says, I want God's blessings, but I'm never going to serve him. I just want to be blessed. I, God, make me this. God, give me this. God, make me have a life full of pleasure. And, and the thing about it is they never want to serve the Lord. Always remember the harvest of sin is only for one season, but the harvest of Christ is for eternity. You'll enjoy those pleasures for a brief time. The Bible says the passing that Moses rejected the passing pleasures of sin. Because he was looking for that eternal thing. He was looking for the reward that is Christ. And if you desire the abundance, you can't allow things to crowd out your love for the Lord in your life. Don't allow stuff 
to crowd out your, your reward in Christ. We, we are in, I've got time. We are living, me and Brother, Brother Brian was talking about this just a moment ago. We're seeing the, the result of years of bad parenting, bad upbringing. We're, we're starting to reap that harvest today. We're seeing it. People don't want to work. Entitled. All of these things. But friends, I'm going to tell you something, and this may make, I don't think it'll make all of you mad, but it may make somebody mad. But I think we err as parents. When we tell our kids, we're going to go to every ball game and everything, we don't care if it's every church night that there is. We don't care. You know, we'll do church when, when the season's over, and they pick every sport that there is. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. I see this happening far more. When I was a kid, if a coach even thought about having practice on a Wednesday, they had the torches and the pitchforks at the school, and he was, he was ready to convert to whatever religion we offered him when we were done with him. But nowadays, they don't care. You don't want to play. And, and you know, if Christian parents would say no, but we don't do that. I know I'm meddling, and I know it makes people upset, and it, it makes them cringe in our day and in our age in which we live, and we can make all sorts of excuses, but what we're doing is we are devaluing the house of God and the things of God, and we're putting the pleasures of life above them because I've got news for you. Junior may be good on his school sports team, but the chances of him making pro are slim to none. Say, well, he's going to get a scholarship. Well, good. I'm glad he's going to get a scholarship. But listen, a, a, an education, a scholarship, that money, it's fleeting. And in the long run, the long run, what was eternal is what matters the most. Amen. That, that little tirade only took me two minutes. And I have people say, well, you're a preacher. You're just trying to get people in church. I'm not trying to get people in church. I'm trying to get them into heaven. And I'm trying to save your child a lifetime of misery because we live in a culture today. The culture today, listen, people always, people ask me a lot of times, well, it seems like church is different. You know, we used to have this and this stuff going on. Well, listen, here's the difference. Today, people think if they go to church once a month, they're a regular attender. Once a month. Why, Why do they think once a month is a regular attender? Because they were brought up to believe you just go to church when it's convenient. Maybe I was raised different. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. Old I am, and I'm not apologetic for it. I've had my kids growing up, we go to church all the time. Well, that's your tough luck. That's what we do. We don't want to go to the hospital with you, Dad. Tough. <laughs> they were in the ministry whether they wanted to be here or not. I mean, they, we didn't have nobody to, a lot of, sometimes we didn't have somebody to keep them with. They just went to the hospitals with us. They went to the funeral homes with us. They went and visited people with us. And, we, and when they would fuss, like, this is who we are. This is what we do. My mama wasn't in the ministry, but when it was nursing home night, she took me every time to nursing home night. And listen, when you're seven years old, you hate nursing home night. <laughs> Shake hands with the people. And nursing home night, it was on Thursday, and that's when Buck Rogers was on. <laughs> but Mama took me to nursing home night, and I would I would go with her because she played the piano. Sister Christopher got up and spoke, and they would pat me on the face. They'd talk to me, and I'd go to nursing home night at seven years old. I know every one of those people have gone into eternity from nursing home night because they'd all be 180 years old now. But you know what? I don't regret it. I don't regret it. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm telling you, the things of God are eternal. Leonard Ravenhill, his tombstone says it. Is what you're living for worth Christ dying for? That says it all. What I'm living for, worth Christ dying for. And so, listen, I say it all that in love. If you're mad at me, 
Get over it. All right. Because there's nothing I can do. I'm not changing my beliefs. I've never, I never have, I never will. I don't change my beliefs based on this culture. I, my kids come in, they believe something different I believe. Guess what? They're the ones that's wrong, not me. It's still, you know, this is, I'm going to stick as close to the word as I can because I want to be like Jesus. And I know one day I'm going to stand before a living God and give an account for every word that I, every idle word will give an account for. And he holds preachers to a higher standard. I'm here to please God, not men. Finally, there is the productive soil. This is what I want to be, the productive soil. Luke 8, 8. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. Verse 15. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and a good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So of these four soils, only one soil produced fruit. This soil was so rich that one seed could produce an entire forest. One seed would produce a hundredfold. If there is any lack in your life, it isn't a problem with the seed. It isn't a problem with the promise, but it is a problem with the soil. Get the right soil and there'll be an abundance. According to Hosea, there are two important things to remember about the soil. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. We must sow the right things into the soil of our hearts. We must keep it properly maintained in order to reap a harvest. Paul told Timothy, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. The writer of Hebrews warned, for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and every disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Friends, we need to know that God takes this seriously and our walk with God must be serious. We've got to make sure that our heart is proper and ready to receive the word of God that we can grow and be productive. And the seed that is planted in good soil, it will bring forth an abundance, an abundance of love, an abundance of joy, of peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want that kind of harvest in my life. If you want the abundance of God in your life, you've got to cultivate the soil. You got to break it up. You got to make sure that, that that soil is just right. When I'd work for that old one-legged man in his garden, he had a he had this old uh, Coca-Cola cooler out of a store. I think he found it at a junkyard somewhere, and it was it was kind of big. It was out in his garden, and he would throw throw uh, old rotten lettuce and stuff like that. It was just nasty, nasty. And he'd send me over there and say, Jeff, you go over there and you dig up in there. And you reach down in that stuff and, and it would be full of earthworms. Nastiness. And he'd say, you spread them worms out there, Jeff. Get those worms out in my field so they'll, they'll make the ground right. And then he'd, he'd say, we're going to go over here to so-and-so's house. What are we going to do over there? Grab a shovel. What are we getting? Fertilizer. <laughs> this job stinks, Mr. Young. And he's got, you know, he's one-legged. He can't, he can't lift, he can't push a shovel in there. He's, he's a harsh taskmaster. I'm out there shoveling stuff, getting nasty earthworms out of this concoction. He's got fermenting over here. Working, working like a Hebrew slave in the Bible. I mean, I, 
wanting somebody to let my people go. And he, he had worked me out there. I mean, he would work me, and, and uh, I think he just worked me because, number one, he liked to watch me doing stuff and carrying stuff. But he'd be on his hands and knees out there working with me a lot of times. But number two, I think he just liked the company. You know, the thing about, about him was, it was this. Every time I left his house, number one, he would always pay me good. And number two, he'd give me a sack of fresh produce for my mama. And he'd say, take this home. Give this, give this to your mama. Make sure she cooks this. This is some good stuff here. Look at these tomatoes, Jeff. Look at these tomatoes. I'm like, yeah, I helped those things grow. I threw the worms and the manure on them. I helped that grow. You know, it was a lot of work making sure that soil was productive. It was a lot of work to get out there every summer with him. He was my, my one-act play director. He was an English teacher at the school. And he would, he would have me out in that garden every chance he got. I mean, I, I could work steady during the summers just going to his yard and working. And he would always work so hard on that, but he had the prettiest garden you ever saw. And it was always productive. He grew everything that you could imagine. It was growing out there. It was always, you know, always had trouble trying to grow okra, ants and everything. And not Mr. Young, he grew that okra good. Them potatoes, he grew, he grew it. I mean, it, nothing was rotting on the vine. He always got it in at just the right moment. And if we'll let the soil of our heart, if we'll work it, if we'll weed it, if we'll make sure that we're keeping the bugs out, if, we're, if we'll do the, the hard things when you don't see much growing yet, if we'll keep doing the hard things and don't get impatient, we'll reap if we don't faint and we'll have a harvest like you wouldn't believe in Jesus' name. There's coming a wonderful promise. I love it in the book of Amos. Amos 9, 13, the prophet says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. Do you see that? The promise is that in the last days, the reaper will overtake the sower. As soon as we plant the seed, it'll grow up. As soon as... There, there are people you've been praying for, and in Jesus' name, there's coming a day as soon as that seed touches their life, it's going to grow up into repentance. It's going to grow up. They're going to receive Christ. They're going to grow in Christ. The, the reaper's going to overtake the sower. No sooner can you get the words out of your mouth, they're saying, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to be saved? That day's coming according to the Word of God, and I say, Lord, do it here in Jesus' name. Let that be our, our house. God promises a day of harvest that will happen the moment you throw the seed. Lord, prepare that kind of soil for us. Let this soil be perfect for that. Let this soil be, have all the nutrients in it. I don't want us to be hardened soil. I don't want thorns and thistles and everything else. I, I, I don't want any of that stuff. Let, this, let our hearts, let this church be a place where it's good soil. And when the word of God is preached, taught, and proclaimed, it brings forth a harvest. Because listen, there's nothing wrong with the word. His word will not return to him void. It's the indestructible seed. It, it, his word going forth, it, it will accomplish what he, he is, intends for it. But our hearts, our soul has to be perfect. It has to be ready for God to do a work in us. So I say, Lord, I heard your story tonight, and I want that to be my heart in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord, for what it means to us. And I ask, Father, in Jesus' name, that the soul of our heart would be right before you. Jesus, that you would do a work in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, that you'd be glorified and magnified and bring forth a great harvest of souls amongst us. We ask these things in the strong, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You love one another. You are dismissed.
ma'am. Okay. You said don't call you back. Yeah. Well, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't. That was on my mind. I was so busy. Oh, don't worry about it. It wasn't a habit. But hey, listen, I know people that left this church and my God was on the air. I wouldn't take nothing from my gardener now, brother.